even in this crisis, life is not just a series of crises to be endured. It is to be enjoyed. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm so excited to have my next guest here, Tara Schuster. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. Super excited to have you. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the great Tara. So she has a book out that just came out in paperback, actually, called Buy Yourself the Effing Lilies. That is so, so good and so inspiring. The subtitle is And Other Rituals to Fix Your Life. Uh, so you can imagine how inspiring that is. But first of all, uh, Tara is is just funny, right? Which we all need humor <laughs> along the way. And uh, she's she was uh, she served as vice president of talent and development at Comedy Central, where she was executive in charge of Key and Peel and Midnight and Lights Out with uh, David Spade, who, as I was just sharing with Tara, went to school with me and is awesome. Um, at Arizona State University, and her writing has appeared in lots of publications, In Style, Forbes, and The New Yorker. And in her late 20s, uh, Tara was an Ivy League graduate and a rising TV executive who had worked for The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, love that show, and helped launch Key and Peel to viral superstardom. And on the outside, she had mastered being a grown-up, but beneath that, she just stayed funny and uh, <laughs> continued to just keep trying and uh, put a plug in for my book, remained undaunted um, along the way. And uh, no one knew that her road to adulthood had been paved with some real challenges around anxiety and shame. And, and she realized she'd hit rock bottom when she drunk dialed her therapist pleading for help which is just, wow, on, on a lot of levels. So, But her new book, Yourself, the Effing Lilies, is really the story. And like I said, so inspiring to hear Tara's path to reparenting herself and becoming a ninja of self-love and just through simple daily rituals. And I just, I can't emphasize it enough. I just love, love, loved it. And you should... Definitely go out and uh, get this book on, uh, it's on audio as well, right? Yeah, it's audible, yeah. anywhere books are sold, the whole awesome. deal. Awesome. Very, very awesome. So let's just jump into it. Welcome. Thank first you. Of all. Yeah, Thank you. So, so great. So where are you at right now? Where is your home base in it from? Los Angeles, California, awesome. in my apartment that I've been cooped up in for a year, <laughs> like the rest of us. Good times. So in your in the book, you're covering uh, deep and heartfelt topics about the hardest moments of your life and uh, so authentic. And I just love, love, loved it. I think it's something that people need to hear, especially right now, hopefully coming out of this pandemic. But your book has been described as a candid, hysterically funny, addictive, readable, practical guide to growing up. How have you been able to express your emotions and just be so transparent. I mean, it's just, it's really pretty awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's funny. I get asked this question a lot, actually, in different words, but how are you so honest? Like, mm -hmm. you're so honest in the book. And it never occurred to me to be any other way. Like, afterwards, I was like, wait, should I have been lying? Did I, like, say too much? Yeah. <laughs> like, it made me self-conscious after the fact. But the whole reason I wrote the book, you know, it wasn't to write a book. It was to save my life. I, I grew up in a house where things came to die. I was neglected and psychologically abused as a child. And it kind of left me as this mess wreck disaster of a person. But by the time I was 25, I had zero clue as to how to take care of myself. And I, I just frankly didn't think I was worth very much. I mean, I was told that I wasn't my whole life. You believe what you're told. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really thought I was worthless. And as you described, it took 
bottoming out on my 25th birthday when I drunk dialed my therapist threatening to hurt myself for me to hit rock bottom and be forced to take a look in the mirror and say, if I don't get better, I'm not going to have much of a life to live. And, and it, that was really contrasted though with killing it at work. Mm-hmm. So because I had always found my validation from external sources other than my parents, I always was moving, 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 you know, got myself into an Ivy League college, got myself up the corporate ladder really quickly because that was the only, the only thing that made me feel any kind of worth. So, you know, on the outside, I look like I had it all together. I'm this rising executive killing it. But on the inside, I was imploding. And and that implosion at 25, it made me stop and think, okay, I didn't have parents who nurtured me at all. If somebody's going to nurture me, it's got to be me. How do I do that? And I attacked it like it was a school project or a work project, got out the Google Doc and was just like, what are values? What are principles? What are vegetables? Like genuinely what are vegetables and which ones should I be eating? Because that was stuff I had never learned. Just never learned. Yeah. And and that sort of made up the book. There's a long way of answering your question. Why be on, you know, how did, how was I so honest or where did that kind of come from? It's because the work of the book was the work of saving my life. So I did all of that and made this 600 page Google Doc reparented myself and five years later felt like a different person. And that's when I thought, oh my God, I have this 600 page Google doc of how I reparented myself in five years. I have to share this. That is awesome. So when you finally got to that point where you were hitting rock bottom and you were talking about where, so you were working at the time and where were you at at that point? I was at Comedy Central. Wow. And you were just, were you in New York or? Yeah. So I started, I interned at the Daily Show and that got me my first entry level position at Comedy Central proper in New York. And so when I was 25, I was a rising junior, junior baby executive. I'm definitely on the, on the right track. Um, but early in my career. Wow. And then did you, did you take a break? I mean, did you actually? Never go back. You didn't take a break. You just never, kept working I, through it. I worked through it. I mean, I didn't even take a break to write the book. I wrote the book in the morning before I went to my executive job. Um, wow. Yeah. And that's sort of the message of this book is you don't need to take off to the woods and like forget about this life in order to heal your traumas or your, you know, things that are not as traumatic. Um, you can integrate these things into your life and even within your current circumstances, really change things. And I know because I did, you know, I didn't have like an eat, pray, love, trust fund to go, you know, find myself. I had to mm-hmm. find myself and get to work. Yeah. It's so do you think your bosses knew? At the no, time? So, definitely. No, not. nobody knew. Nobody knew. It's so interesting. I've I've been thinking a lot about this. So 70% of the workforce today are millennials. And Oh wow, 70. Yeah, 70% and I really give millennials credit for bringing mental health to the forefront of being okay, right? Yeah. And that everybody has something, right? Yeah. And I tell people that it wasn't okay to sort of talk about things at work, like work was for work. And, you know, when you're going through something challenging and I mean, I I feel like as a CEO today, I was just sharing with somebody earlier that I feel like at times I've become the den mother. And sometimes it's people that you don't even expect, right? It's the kids, they're homeschooling their kids. And it's just like a breaking point where you start to really right. And it, I feel like it's, it's really, liberated a lot of us to know that it's okay. It doesn't mean that you're a bad executive. Oh, no. And, you know, to be clear, when I was going through all of this, I told literally no one. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't something that I discussed at work or felt comfortable discussing at work. Yeah. And what's been interesting for me is as the book's been released is to hear how people at 
you know, they tell me it makes them feel less alone. They totally. feel like, you know, if if I could do it, they could do it. And a lot of the younger um, people at work, the um, millennials, uh, the Gen Z, they're the ones who are going to change the world because mm-hmm. they actually it's inherent to them. They don't hide who they are. No. But I but I do think in the corporate world today, I think there's still a lot of stigma around mental health. Yeah, I think it's actually um, I don't advocate that people openly talk about their mental health struggles in the workplace because I don't think we're there yet. Frankly, you know, so I think if you have like a boss, it, you know, it sounds like you're a boss who can be a den mother and is there to be with their employees. I think that's amazing. But I, I'm really sensitive to the fact that that's not every work environment. Yeah, no. And it's it's hard. And I think also as we hopefully start to go back into I don't think we'll all go back into offices five days a week anytime soon. But I think hopefully there are a lot of millennials who were celebrating you know, working from home in the beginning and now they want to go back into an office yeah. because of community and which community. is another thing, right? Yeah. Where they brought to people that they, they may not, you know, their office mate that sits next to them might not be the person they go out for cocktails with, but they're, you know, they like having an espresso with them and joking around and, you know, yeah. talking about their dogs, right? It, it's yeah, just, it's- they miss that. I we I mean I miss it. I miss yeah. it intensely. The the camaraderie of just even sitting in a boring meeting and being able to be bored with your colleague and say yeah. afterwards, no, totally. didn't that suck? Like yeah. even that I really miss. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it's it's uh it'll be it's something I think a lot about about leadership, but I also think it's just a uh you know, as it relates to mental health, I think it's just just the awareness. And especially during this time, I think you cannot be a leader today and not be aware of mental health for long. Absolutely. You know, oh, for and, long. Absolutely. Yeah. You can you can be a leader, but you can't sit there and shut it down because I think it just comes in. You know, right now it's, I think, coming in spades in so many different directions. So, yeah, I agree. Um, Super great to hear how authentic you are and how much you're helping people because I, it's definitely super, super important. So you mentioned a mantra during times of fear or anxiety where you say it's okay, sweetheart. So talk mm. to me a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, I, looking back, I was never, um, really comforted if something was scary or, um, unsafe as a child, there was nobody to hold me and say, Oh, it's okay, sweetheart. Like you're fine. Or this will get better. Mm -hmm. I was really told things won't get better. We, you are doomed. This is doomed. A lot of messages about how unsafe I was. And as I've grown older, what I've realized is part of the work of healing myself is giving myself those messages of comfort. So when I'm feeling stressed out, anxious, scared, I literally put my hand on my heart and say out loud, it's okay, sweetheart, the way you would a young child. And I, I, you know, I dare anyone to do that and not feel comforted. It, It is an instant way to connect to yourself and to ground yourself. Yeah which is the wise thing to do when we're confronted by fear or something we're not sure if we can accomplish um, or get through is instead of to be mean to ourselves and say, push, 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 like you need to get through this is to give ourselves the space and the comfort of feeling okay in those mm-hmm. scary situations. Yeah, totally. Do you think when you entered the workforce that it, it kind of, Maybe you started managing people and may, do you think that because of your upbringing, you had sort of a different perspective on that versus how you are today? Yeah, I think I, you know, looking back, I was probably more harsh than I w- would want to be because I was so harsh to myself. Mm-hmm. Like I was operating and I'm talking about like really young, you know, like um, like my first manager positions. I didn't know how to be kind to myself. And if you mm-hmm. don't know how to be kind to yourself, it is very hard to be kind to others if, if that's not just a habit of yours. And so now I actually care a lot more about how I act 
than sort of what I achieve. How did I show up for the people in my office? Was I kind? Did I give them the benefit of the doubt? Did I look out for them? That is a, is a really big part of how I think about business because ultimately you want the people around you to feel safe enough to take risks, to be productive, to show you what their unique, shiny attributes are. And the only way people reveal the things that they, how, how they're going to add value is if they feel safe. Mm -hmm. So now I really try to lead with kindness. You know, there was there was that time when all the books were like radical candor and have this tough conversation. And now I'm like, what about radical kindness? What about we're humans here on this planet also? And for me to be a good leader, one of the things I can do is make it really safe for you to show up with your unique talents your diverse talents so that this team has a lot of value add, not a lot of value fit, but a a lot of add. And so that's a lot different now is I really understand the utter importance of grounding everything in kindness. Maybe not the competition. (laughs) Maybe they're not grounding kindness, but your colleagues. I feel like you've worked around funny people you know, comedians for so long. Did you feel like there was a big understanding once you actually did disclose that you were sort of working through maybe to only a small group initially? Did you feel like that was like they sort of got you? You know, it's funny, not on that. Like I Mm -hmm. never told anyone any of this, you know, really it wasn't until my book came out that anyone would have any idea. Really? Yeah. Wow. I I was very private. I am very private, which is so weird because there's a literal book with over 100,000 copies sold of yeah. my life. So not, how private can I be? But yeah, I don't really talk about my personal life or my yeah. emotions at yeah. work. Um, but with comedians, I think why I always um, got along with comedians is because I never took myself seriously as an executive. I never was like, this job defines me, my my identity is wrapped up in this. My only thought was, how can I help your career? You know, you're a great artist. What you're doing is vulnerable and scary. How can I bolster you and bolster our audience by getting your story to them in a authentic, not watered down way? And I think because that was sort of how I looked at being an executive, comedians responded to that in a way that they don't if you're just like, you know, a suit who is crunching numbers. You know, obviously I'm doing that too, but I just did it in a very different kind of way. way. Yeah. Yeah. But I just think that the authenticness of it's welcome, right? And that's what people respond to. And Yeah. It's, it's funny because I get that comment a lot, you know, and then I get worried that like, what if I, if I'm not authentic, like, and, and what is authentic? Like, what am I doing? Like, I'm just kind of being me. So like, what if I, then I get like a little worried that it's going to like go away. And then I remember, no, nah, just keep doing what you're doing. You'll be fine. Yeah. No, you will absolutely be, be fine. So I, one of the questions I had, so you're 25 and not, you're not 25 right now, but when you went, started this process, how did you start healing? What was sort of the the big kind of steps? And I think this really speaks to somebody who is maybe thinking, okay, do I, you know, just keep putting on my Lululemons today and just go on? Or do I actually just tell everybody that I'm really having a hard time? I mean, you touched on this a little bit. Like, what do you do? Yeah, it's such a good question um, because I think people get overwhelmed and then don't start because they think it's going to be too hard to do all of the works. And so why even begin? And I think the first step for everyone is finding a way to become a little more self-aware. So that's just even aware of the emotions you are currently holding and feeling because we have basically no practice doing that. You know, what's our, so true. Yeah. What's our default answer to how are you? I'm fine. I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm busy. 
we just have no practice knowing how we actually feel. So I think the easiest way to build self-awareness is to begin by journaling. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people roll their eyes. They're like, oh, you know, like, first off, that sounds cheesy. Journaling is for broken narcissists. Or they think uh, that's too much of a time commitment. I don't have time to do it. And what what I would challenge is you don't have time not to do it. Mm -hmm. You you no longer have time not to know who you are. So even by journaling an answer to this question, how am I actually feeling? Even that gives you a modicum of self-awareness. And when you do it over time, like every day, you really start to get to know yourself. So really any practice where you're building a little self-awareness into your life shows you here's the path, here's here's where I'm going to need to do the work. And then it's baby stepping into the work. You know, if, if you're writing in your journal about an upsetting relationship, um, something at work, you know, whatever it is, the next question is, what is the first baby step I can take towards healing this? You know, not like how is it all going to work out in the end, but just if you are in, you know, a toxic friendship, for example, mm-hmm. maybe it's not being around that person. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's these little teeny micro adjustments um, that I write about in the book that can really change the trajectory of your life. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I'm smiling because I... uh tweeted uh last night about this that my 15 year old was talking to somebody on the phone and i over i was in my office and and i overheard him say uh what what did he say exactly he said uh you don't always have to be uh happy because there's points along the way where maybe you aren't happy and you need to pay attention to the lessons that you're learning and he's 15. Wow. Yeah. And I was just and so I said to him afterwards, I was like, so who are you saying that? To? <laughs> right. Because yeah. I because I thought like who was on the other end. And, and he said, uh, I actually thought he was talking to a guy that's a friend of his that he was playing Fortnite with. And he said, no, there was um, there was a girl that I'm a friend that I'm friends with. And these girls were being really terrible to her. Mm. And she was focusing on she wanted to be happy. Mm. And and he said, but I, you know, went on to tell her that, um, you know, pay attention to the lessons. And you talked about toxic friendships and, yeah. you know, whatever. And it made me just really think about that. And I just said, that's so like not what I thought that was at all. And I on so many other levels, I'm proud of you. And you how, know, how said, wise of your son. I mean, that's a, a huge part of my book is paying attention to those dark yeah. moments. I, I did and learning. I call it sacred rock bottom. Each rock bottom we go to, each terrible experience in, in seen from one light, it's like, Oh, this is terrible. There's no, like, why am I going through this? But in another sense, it's always an awakening of totally. where you need to grow. So it's really just like, are you going to avail yourself of this opportunity? Where do you shut it out and ignore it? And I would I would follow your son's advice and yeah. see what I could learn from it. And see what you can learn from it. Well, it's funny. I think back on life, and I always had this problem when people would say, oh, forget about that. Like, forget about stuff that happened. And then... I started re- realizing that all of those sort of challenges or failures, I mean, this is a lot of what I talk about in my book, Undaunted, is that, you know, you're going to have failures. You're going to have challenges along the way, and they're lessons. And looking back, it, it helps you realize that the dots eventually connect if yeah. you pay attention. And, you know, the thing I would add to that is, and I write a lot about this in my book is that which you do not deal with deals with you always. That's a, that's a promise I can make to anyone. And the idea that you should ignore or just blindly move past these things is ridiculous and has worked for approximately no one. So, you know, I, sometimes people say to me, Oh, this, you know, this really painful thing happened. I just don't think I can deal with it. And I always just say to them, well, it's dealing with you. Yeah. So whether no, or not, so true. <laughs> I mean, 
So you have a choice here, you know? Yeah. I think it is, it is so true. And I think it's just a, a wake up call to so many people just to go and deal with it. And you're smiling today, right? I mean, yeah, that, I, I, yeah I am, you work through a lot of stuff. Yes. And, you know, having been on both sides. So how I began was I'm not grateful. I have a chip on my shoulder. I was dealt these terrible parents. It's not my fault. Blame, blame, blame. Uh, I'm going to be miserable forever. I did the work of taking care of myself. I said, mm-hmm. okay, I am going to take responsibility for my life now fully. For mm-hmm. everything that happens, I am going to be responsible. And it is such an easier way to live. Yeah. Because I'm not constantly like, I'm not blaming people. I'm grateful for what I have. I have worked through so many of my issues that were unknown to me at the time. And so if anyone's listening who feels like it's going to be overwhelming and they, and they quote unquote, just can't deal. I mean, I'm just here to say it is a way more joyful path when you say, okay, this stuff happened. It wasn't great, but now I own my narrative. I own this story and I'm going to change the ending. Did you end up going back to your family and sort of other people that you felt like you needed to kind of really have a conversation with them about some of these? It's interesting because we have this um, concept of closure, right? Mm -hmm. That people want closure. And I think that's pretty ridiculous. Like you cannot control the reactions or stories that other people hold. You can only control your own reactions. Mm -hmm. So my parents, for example, um, you know, they did not set out to neglect me. Mm -hmm. Nobody says, let me screw up my kid as much as I possibly can. They did their best. And so for me, really what the journey was, was instead of needing to have, you know, a big heart to heart with them, was getting honest with myself that they did their best. They loved me the best they could. And that wasn't good enough for me. And I was going to have to step in and how they treated me just was not personal. We, we think of the relationship with our parents as utterly personal. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's simply how your parent is programmed to treat you, which is exactly how they treat everyone else. So, you know, there was no Disney moment of and then. You know, my mom got better. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't speak to my mom and my relationship with my dad is complicated Mm -hmm. and I'm stable, happy, held in love by all of my friends and their parents. So we find our ways. It's just I I think it's really freeing once you kind of realize, oh, this wasn't personal. The way my parents treat me just isn't that personal. Mm hmm. Yeah. No, it, yeah, it wasn't against you. It was what they, it's what they knew. Yeah. It's what they knew. And it's, it's so true. And I think also the time that they grew up in too. I think that's a, that's another piece of it as well and what their circumstances were. So, and that's the big thing. And and I think in my book, I never, you know, we were talking about kindness at the beginning Mm -hmm. and I really set out to never paint my parents as villains. You know, I'm never, I don't pretend to know what happened to them to make them the kinds of parents they were. Any adult who treats their children like that clearly went through something themselves. Um, And I just, I think giving people a little bit of the benefit of the doubt about why it ended up this way. I mean, of course, I've been through extensive therapy in order to feel this way. And I don't feel this way every day. You know, at Thanksgiving, when my dad says something insane I can be set off just like anybody else Mm -hmm. but you know by and large I I feel a lot more free of those resentments well and probably much more empathetic to other people who sort of have those you know same challenges because it's uh as we always I always say you can't pick your family right no uh, and it's somebody said that to me Many years ago, and I think we all have our moments for for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, this book isn't just for people who had difficult upbringings at all. 
you know, and I've, I've just, I've noticed this, that there are audiences who they feel like they're good at work, but bad at living. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're hustling, they're grinding, they're on the outside doing really well, but they can find themselves crying in their cubicle at work. Mm -hmm. And they might have had parents who really nurtured them. So then they feel like, oh, I shouldn't feel this bad. I, I should be better. And what I'm trying to say is, no, you can feel however you actually do feel, but it's time to face that. How do you mm -hmm. actually feel? Then we can heal from it. And and so it's been interesting to hear from readers who had amazing households growing up. And still have a lot of the same issues I had the same at the at the start of the book. Yeah, no, I think that that's so true. So uh, one of the quotes that I read about you in a Forbes interview, I'm going to totally surprise you here. OK, I don't ultimately need to know what I want to do one day when I grow up. I just need to know what I want to change today. I love that. Yeah. And uh in in today's age, it's very common for young people to be told to do what you are passionate about or to follow your heart. Can you expand on the idea of changing, just focusing on what you need to change today? Yes. So that article, you know, part of the context was I graduated college in 2008. And in 2008, every commencement address, if you look online, was follow Good your time. bliss. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was like there's a recession. Everything's horrible. Mm -hmm. Follow your bliss. What are you passionate about? And I was like, I'm passionate about puppetry. Is that like what a career I should take? And it really annoyed me because I wasn't in a place to dream. I was barely surviving. You know, I, I had deep psychological problems and there was a recession and this just, it just felt like the most off, um, like not uh, in touch with reality thing to say, follow mm -hmm. your passion. So what I've realized is you don't need to know the end goal. I don't even, I don't know the end goal, but I do every day ask what I'm curious about. What's the little thing that's going to move me closer to whatever small term goal I'm working towards, mm -hmm. even something like writing a book. You know, I wrote this book before work every single day by setting um, a timer on my iPhone, you know, and that every single day was the commitment I could give. Mm. And as long as you're giving a commitment to yourself, you are going to move forward. You know, I couldn't know what this book would lead to. I wouldn't know. I'm currently writing the follow up book to it and, you know, doing speaking engagements. And it's, it's opened up this whole other career for me that I would have never imagined. But I didn't even need to imagine it. Mm -hmm. All I needed to do was commit to myself enough to do the task I wanted to do, to do the one thing right ahead of me exactly. that I, you know, and if we break down everything, into these smaller goals, everything becomes achievable. Yeah. I say that all the time. Yeah. It's, it's so true. I am constantly telling people that I get a lot done in a day, but people always ask me if I'm, do I have huge lists? And I'm like, no, I have <laughs> a couple of things that I get done every single day because if I, if my lists are too long, then I won't get them all done and I'll feel bad about myself that and be, get very, anxious and and so it's the same theory and the key is to it's the trick that you're talking about is to find ways not to feel bad about yourself yeah because basic like that's not where it's the true. good growth that's not we are in a culture that says grind 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 hustle 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 be, you know work yourself to the bone and that's how you're going to succeed but it's not really true you know, creativity, these like great ideas don't necessarily come from I was the busiest, most overworked person in the history of the planet. And that's mm -hmm. how I did it. But that's just sort of um, an, like it's a false narrative. Yeah, I totally agree. So what is the strongest message you hope that people will get out of reading your book? It's one of two things. I think I'm going to go with the second thing. It is that life is not a series of crises to endure. It's to be enjoyed. I think I and I, I 
it's so important to me. I grew up thinking my life was just a crisis to crisis to crisis situation and that I needed to get through my life. Mm -hmm. That led me to drugs and alcohol because I was just trying to get through and cope with my life. Mm -hmm. And I finally realized, oh, wait, I get to live this life. I get to enjoy this life. Why am I, if I'm trying to get through my life, then it's not really set up correctly. And I think, you know, the reason I say this message above the other one I was thinking of is that we are all inherently worthwhile. You know, I I hope people take that away from it too, that, you know, your worth is not based on achievements, relationships, really anything other than, oh, you were born cool, you're worthwhile. Like you are already a worthwhile person on planet earth. But I think in the pandemic in particular, it's important to remember that even in this crisis, life is not just a series of crises to be endured. It is to be enjoyed. It's so true. I love it. So best place to buy your book, buy yourself the effing lilies where Where would you suggest? You can buy it anywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local indie bookstore, anywhere books are sold. I love it so much. And uh, and where are you working today? I mean, where I know in Los Angeles, but are you you have a full time job as well? So fortunately, the book has allowed me to finally take a break to work. Yeah. So I left Comedy Central and I'm currently working on the follow up book and sort of this new career path that opened up to me. I so, love it. That's so great. Yeah. Very, very cool. Well, Thank hopefully you. there will be uh, more funniness down the road because you've definitely been a part of some amazing um, opportunities. So that's really, really great. So, well, thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for listening to Tara today. And uh, Tara, where's the best place to find you as well? So on the gram... Tara Schuster, and I have a newsletter at taraschuster.com where we're growing this really cool community of readers and people who want to bring more kindness to themselves and others. And if you sign up for the newsletter, you get to be a part of it. And we all email, and it's really a, a beautiful thing. I love it. I love it. It's so great. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Mm-hmm. 